Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Jessica Maynard. Um, Jessica uh, has uh, three, she wears three hats at um, Visit Sun Valley. She manages their office, she manages the visitor center, and she serves as their communication specialist. Um, she is from uh, Arequipa, Peru, and she is going to um, share her love of this area with us. So please join me in welcoming Jessica Maynard. Bless you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, it's um, nice to be here and talk about Peru with you. Thank you, Kristen, for organizing. Thank you, Kristen, for organizing all of these events for Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, I have been living in the Valley for about 17 years. I came back in 2000, uh, 2006. And uh, prior to coming here to Idaho, I have never ever heard about Idaho in Peru. <laughs> uh, you hear more, growing up in Peru, you hear more of the big cities like LA, New York, California. Uh, but I decided to come anyways. Um, I had finished studying. I have a bachelor's degree in tourism and hospitality management, and I had done an internship in the winter of 2004, 2005 in Virginia, and then I, did, I was looking for so, another opportunity to work and then be abroad, practice my English skills, and just immerse myself in the culture and somewhere. Um, I have a fascination for traveling and just, I don't know, it's fascinating to learn cultures and talk with native English speakers, and that was the idea. And then during those um, 18 months, I, was, I came to work for Sun Valley Resort. I met my husband and decided to live here. So that's um, how I got here. And I decided to talk about Arequipa because I was born in Arequipa. My mom was born in Arequipa, and all my family from my mom's side is from Arequipa. I grew up in Lima, but um, Arequipa is very dear to my heart, and I grew up visiting a lot. All my family is from there, and it's just a special place, so I thought it was a great city to talk about. Um, just a quick overview about Peru. Peru is the third largest country in South America after Brazil and Argentina. It has three geographic regions, the coast on the Pacific side, the mountains, and then the Amazon. The coast, you can see, is a very narrow strip. It only represents about 10% of Peru, but it's the most populated area, and it is home to more than half of the population of Peru. The Andes is um, the second mountain the second highest mountain range in the world. The Huascaran in Huaraz, the Mount Huascaran is the tallest mountain in Peru, reaching about 22,000 feet. And then the Amazon, you can see all of this is the Selva in Spanish, and it covers almost half of the country. It also extends to Brazil and also covers about half of Brazil and is home to very unique um, animals and plants that don't exist anywhere else in the world. So it's very diverse, very um, unique country. Official languages, we speak Spanish, and then Quechua is the native language, second to Spanish. And it's spoken by about 8 million people in Peru. Uh, there, there are other dialects. Aymara is one of them. And then in native communities, there, there are other dialects as well. Um, as a more in-depth uh, division, Peru has eight natural regions. And they are um, divided based on their altitude, the climate, the soil, the flora and fauna. And on the Andes, the highest one is this Hanka or Cordillera, which ranges from 15,000 to 22,000 feet in elevation. And then on the other side, you go to the Amazon where the altitude goes down. Um, Peru 
had pre-Inca civilizations that were very important. S three of them are the most important ones. One of them is Chavín, then you have Moche, and the Nazca cultures, and all of these are pre-Inca. The Inca is the more um, well-known because they built Machu Picchu, but these other um, tourist attractions, archaeological sites are also very important in Peru. Chavín de Huantar is in Huaraz, and then you have Huaca del Sol and de la Luna. These are temples, and then the Nazca Lines, which are geoglyphs that are etched on the ground. And then, of course, the Spaniards arrived in Peru in the 1532 year. Um, I've included in, in the presentation a lot of photos of my travels, because I do love traveling. I had the opportunity to go to um, Machu Picchu when I was in university in the year 2000, I think. And this is one of the um, fortresses called Sacsayhuaman, super tall um, fortress with these huge stones. And then I went back um, in 2008 with my husband. And then this is Puno. Puno is a very um, high altitude city in the mountains of Peru. And this is an island called um, Uros Island. And it's a floating island in the Lake Titicaca. Titicaca is the highest navigation navigable lake in the world at an altitude of 12,000 feet. And the people in this island, they um, have their houses and boats all made out of reeds of totora plant. And then this is uh, the temple of Chavín de Huantar and the glaciers in Huaraz and just some beautiful lakes there. And then these are the um, Huaca del Sol and de la Luna up in the north in Trujillo. And then you have, of course, also really nice beaches in the coast and deserts. It's just amazing how it changes because in the coast you have beaches and deserts and then in the mountains you have all these lakes and mountains and then the rainforest, this, the Amazon is just completely different. So it has a wide variety of regions. Um, the Amazon um, has um, the Amazon River, which is the second largest river in the world, close to 4,000 miles. It, it begins up high in the Andes, and then it stretches around Peru, Colombia, Brazil, before it ends in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, okay, so now diving into Arequipa. Arequipa is in the south of Peru and it has coast and it has mountain areas. The name comes from the Quechua Arequipay, which the legend says the Inca Maita Capac uh, had a request from his subjects to go to the Chile River Valley. And when they arrived, they were just amazed by the beauty of the landscape and the climate, so they asked for permission to stay, and the Inca responded, yes, let's stay, or yes, stay. Um, Arequipa was founded on August 15, 1540, and it had a very long name, Beautiful Villa of Our Lady of the Assumption. The year after, the name was changed to City of Arequipa, and it gained a lot of, um, predominance during the regal period um, because of the economic activity and it was very royal to the Spanish crown. And even though Peru's independence was July 28, 1821, Arequipa remained under Spaniard um, possession until 1824. It is the second largest city in population in Peru with a population of 1,382,000 people. And it's the second <coughs> highest economic um, city with economic activity in Peru. And um, the city is surrounded by volcanoes. There are three volcanoes. This one here is the most popular one. It's called the Misty Volcano. There are two other ones called Pichu Pichu 
and Chachani. But this one is the most popular one. It's majestic, it's imposing, and it has a very symmetric cone shape and just top snow, um, just snow on the top makes it really, really beautiful. This is uh, one of 10 active volcanoes in Peru. And on a daily basis, it can move about 40 to 60 times. These are very small earthquakes that are imperceptible to people that live in the city. Now, Arequipa is known as the white city, and that is because a lot of the architecture is made out of this stone called sillar. Ashlar in English, but is known as sillar which is the product of volcanic stone with other elements. And like from the top, when you see Arequipa, it's white, mostly because of these constructions. There are some other ones, uh, other constructions, other buildings of like some sort of pinkish sillar, but the predominant one is the white sillar. This, the center of Arequipa um, is historic, and it was named a historic um, World Heritage Site by UNESCO in the year 2000. What makes it so unique is all these buildings that are made of this special stone called Sillar. There is no other city in Peru that has these sort of constructions made out of Sillar. Then, um, also, the architectural um, buildings, they mix all of this um, indigenous building style with um, European designs that are very, very unique. A lot of um, buildings have Baroque facades that are really beautiful. There is um, a large monastery called Santa Catalina, which is a religious citadel and it's just like, like a lot of the architecture in the downtown is, is just impressive and so beautiful. A lot of churches with the arrival of the Spaniards, the religion was imposed and it just stayed with us for like to this day. So Peru is a very religious country. The Catholic religion is predominant. So you can see like a lot of, um, archways, open spaces, vaults, um, even bridges are made out of the, this sillar. And another um, thing is that almost from anywhere in the city of Arequipa, you can see the misty volcano from almost anywhere. And the city is right at the base at the bottom of the volcano. So those are some of the constructions. Um, the downtown, the historic center of Arequipa, is about 332 hectares. It is, includes 49 build blocks from um, the original Spanish layout, plus 24 blocks of the colonial and 19th century. And it has uh, almost 500 casonas. Casonas are these uh, large houses, like very regal and royal from the colonial period. So it has so many of those throughout the city. 500, about 500 of those. Another um, important thing is the tourism activity. Arequipa is the third most visited city in Peru after Cusco and Lima. Of course, Cusco is very popular because of Machu Picchu, and Machu Picchu is one of the seven wonders of the world. So it's very impressive as well, but there is a lot of places in Peru that you can visit that are amazing. The Colca Canyon is the second deepest canyon in the world. And it's, um, oh, these are some pictures from back in 2006 when I went to visit my family, and you can see the misty volcano in the back. And that's my little goddaughter. Um, the um, Colca Canyon is home to the Andean condor, which is the largest bird, um, bird of prey in the world. 
Its wing span measures about 10 feet and it weighs about 33 pounds. And you can see it flying around this area of the Colca Canyon. And that's the um, cathedral. The cathedral building in Arequipa is also very impressive. And one thing that is very common throughout the cities in Peru, you have the main square, which is called the Plaza Mayor, then you have the cathedral, and then you have the government palace or the mayor house. So it's like a very um, um, common in most cities. That's the layout in the downtown. And that's just my family. That's my grandma. My grandma had um, some um, agricultural farms where she would grow um, rice and beans. And we would go visit those two when I was little. Um, a fun, kind of a fun fact or something to mention is the Arequipa has this passport. And this comes from um, the year 1882 when um, there was the war of the Pacific between Peru and Chile. At that time, Lima was occupied by Chilean troops and the president was deported because he refused to surrender. Then the interim president moved to Arequipa. He found refuge in Arequipa and declared Arequipa as an independent republic and he created a passport and everyone had to have a passport to come in and out. And people from Arequipa are very um, proud and very um, just very proud of their traditions and customs of everything related to, to the city, to that region. Now you call a person from Arequipa, you call him Arequipeño, Arequipeña. The Quechua word is characato, which means agricultural worker from the maize fields. Um, for, in terms of the food, the cuisine is very particular. Um, restaurants that serve food from Arequipa are called picanteria, and that comes from the word picante, which means spicy. And they use chilies in a lot of their food, in, whether it's a stew, um, this sort of sauce or cream that is served with potatoes, it's called ocopa. So you can see the use of this chili in a lot of the food. This is a red chili pepper that is stuffed with a ground beef um, sort of a stew with cheese on top. Um, this is a sort of scalloped potatoes, but with a different flavor. And this is a stew made of pork, adobo. And then um, this is a special salad from Arequipa called solterito de queso. Um, they're very heavy on the potatoes and the rice and the meat. It's like every time I go visit my family, it's like a big bowl of soup and then that's the sort of appetizer. And then you have the main dish, which is like something like this, just big pieces of meat and just a lot of, a lot of food and very spicy. If it doesn't have a spicy on it, then they give you a side of chili. <laughs> everything, almost everything you eat with chili. Now another thing it, like is very important in our culture in Peru is this folklore, folk dances, which is called danza típica. And Almost all regions, well, not almost, all regions in Peru have tip, um, folk dances that are typical from their region, and they usually have a meaning. In Arequipa, this is called Carnaval de Arequipa. The, the, the outfit is very colorful and it's a celebration. And um, I have a video here where you can um, see the dance. And we would dance this in, um, family gatherings and just during this is a special dance in Arequipa
but on the top and throughout their outfits, they have these little water balloons up here in their hats. In the month of February, even sometimes when you're walking on the streets, people throw water balloons at you. So that was always kind of fun <laughs> growing up, except when you wanted to go somewhere and then you're wet. <laughs> but it was, uh, yeah, so they, like, some sort of family reunion or I don't know, specific event. Sometimes people in the family, we would just start dancing this song. Growing up, this was one of the things that we would learn in a school, just different dances um, for, I don't know, school week, spirit week, and each class would learn one of the dances, and then on, um, I don't know, the special day, each class would dance one of the songs that you've learned throughout the year. During the dance, they don't. <laughs> oh, it's not moving. And the, um, each region has uh, different sort of dances, like a lot of the ones in the mountains have these sort of um, outfits with the skirts and the hats. Um, in the coast, as we move here to the next slide, we'll see other sorts of typical dances from the north, from south of Lima. Oh, this one is another, um, you can play it and fast forward it to the minute 7, 724. Uh, this one is um, a special celebration called Yunsa. The Yunsa, um, I don't know, growing up I attended a few of them and they're kind of etched in my memory. It can be smaller, but it can be uh, also really big for a whole community and people dance, um, they parade sometimes through town and then they go to a point where there is a tree and then the tree has presents, um, it's sort of like, reminds me of a piñata but uh -huh, because it has some presents that you get at the end and people dance around the tree and then with a hatch they um, hit the tree to try and make it fall to the ground. Um, go ahead and play it and fast forward it to minute 724. So that's how they Those are very typical from the mountains, the Andes. And then that's the tree and then with the hatch, you just hit it a few times and then people take turns hitting the tree. You hit it, yeah, quite a few times sometimes. <laughs> and it's just a big, it can be a big festivity. And it's like a whole community, it looks like. So 
they are growing up, those are some of the, um, some of the unique um, experiences that I've grown up with, but not, not as big as those. Now, this is a typical folk dance from Ica, which is at the south of Lima. It's called Festejo. Very upbeat, and this one has influence from the Afro um, culture because at some point there were African slaves brought to Peru. So our culture has a mixture of indigenous um, Indian tribes, um, Europeans in other countries, but mostly um, Indians and Europeans. Okay, so those are some of the outfits that we've seen in this video. Like the really um, short skirt with a little top. And then this one is completely different. This is from the north of Peru. And this is called Marinera Norteña. And this one here, this is a... Um, this was a dance that was during my sister's wedding that she had um, a couple years ago. This one you should be able to play, I think. It's not playing. Okay. Like the footwork, very impressive. It has a lot of um, footwork. I never learned this one. <laughs> They different, like long skirts. This is more of a courtship type of dance where the uh, man and the woman are like flirting per se. It's really, really different. And then this one is from the um, Amazon. This is a whole different type of dance. And you can see the difference in the outfits too. A lot of these are outfits particular from the region. And this one is from the Andes again. This is, this is a very popular dance called Waino, or Wailash. Wailash, and it has a different type of footwork. Like a lot of, it's called Zapateo, just step, step, And this is uh, from, uh, these images are actually from trailing of the sheep. And you can see this is the Marinera Norteña and those are the festejo outfits. This is a different type of uh, folk dance from the south, from Puno actually, called Saya. And that's me back in high school dancing, like I said, learning some of those. This is from university. Um, and then um, this is called uh, it's a dessert, a sort of Peruvian cookie uh, made with flour and butter. And in the center, it has manjar blanco. It's uh, dulce de leche. It's known as dulce de leche. It's sort of a, um, like Nutella, but made with milk and sugar. And I made those for you to try today. Oh. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Yeah, and if, if you have any questions, <laughs> yes, Wendy. When, when the tree was being chopped down, oh. 
when the when the folks were uh, chopping down the tree, um, there were some red um, kind of cubes. Boxes. Oh, those were. What were they uh, doing? Those are um, big boxes of beer, actually, because people are just dancing and drinking, and a lot of the time, each family or each people would bring um, a box of beer. It's just. Okay. It's a huge box. <laughs> Thank you. It's not like your six pack here. <laughs> um, so we might see some of these next Saturday when the Peruvian dancers come up. They usually, yeah, usually during trailing the Midwest, of the sheep. The Midwest, I guess. Uh -huh. yeah. During trailing of the sheep at the folk uh, festival and during the parade, there are Peruvian dancers. and. You know, Idaho has this uh, Peruvian history with its sheep herders, uh, which I didn't know about, <laughs> <laughs> but now I know. But there is a large Peruvian community because of that, mm -hmm. because back in the day, they came for um, the sheep farms, and a lot of them um, settled in this, in this area. So yeah, you will see during the folk fair, and during the parade, you should see some of the Peruvian dancers. Okay. They perform usually during the yeah. festivities. Some of the music sounded familiar to me, and oh, really? I, I'm pretty sure it came from For the the um, what I've seen, you mm -hmm. know, in the Haley Park. Yes, yes, uh -huh. the Wailash. The, the The sky is a beautiful blue. And I spent some time in Lima, and it's quite gray. Is is that typical year round, or is it like Lima, where half the year it's a gray city? No, no. Lima is quite different from Arequipa because Lima is in the coast; it's overcast yes. most of the time, plus the pollution. Arequipa is more like Idaho in the sense that it's in the mountains. It has less pollution on one hand, but the climate is much nicer, and it's very similar. Um, to hear a clear sky, um, it can get really cold sometimes, a lot of rain in the rain in the spring season, uh, but it is like in the photos, like a, l a little more blue sky, nothing like Lima. Yeah. yeah, Lima has a funny name or nickname, not funny, but for some people, uh, Lima the Gray. <laughs> yeah, because it's Just usually one drop of rain a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it actually drizzles a lot in Lima, yeah. mm -hmm, being coast, close to the sea and in the coast. Mm -hmm. I was surprised yes. to see how um, how much of Peru is part of the Amazon mm -hmm. basin. Is there a lot of connection between the people who live in the Amazon area coming over the Andes and then into more of the coastal? I mean, is there cultural exchange, economic exchange? There is economic exchange, like some cities are produce, say Arequipa produces a lot of onions and garlic, um, and other, like the Amazon produces a lot of fruit, a lot of unique types of fruit, so there is a lot of exchange of produce. Um, in terms of like, I feel like most people stick to the region. Sometimes you can see people like my mom that moved out of um, Arequipa to the city, to Lima. Uh, um, well, Arequipa is also a city, but uh, a different city. So there is sometimes a little bit of that migration from certain areas. Now, a lot of people actually back in the day migrated from the Amazon and the mountains, the rural areas to the coast. Like I said, like the coast is so narrow and small, but it's home to more than half of the population of Peru because it's more developed. It's bigger cities, so people were looking for job opportunities, more, um, more to do, just bigger developed cities. The Amazon contains um, a lot of um, protected areas. Peru created um, reserves, which is um, a protected area that has unique species of plants and animals that don't exist in other parts of the world. So that's a lot of those portions of the Amazon are protected areas, and a lot some too in the mountains. 
Do we have any other questions? Oh, great. So, Jessica, the people that came from Peru, say, last January, can you go back to the map and show us where they came from? Because they didn't come well, necessarily from the coast. Am I right about that? Well, I think a lot of them um, come from the mountain regions. Let's see. Go back to the map. Very <laughs> so, like, that's Lima, the capital. I think a lot of people um, come from areas, these areas called Ayacucho, um, Huancayo. Huancayo is around this section, Huanuco, Huancayo, from this, mostly this center section, I think. I don't know them all either, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I think for, from the mo for the most part from this mountain section. And are you, can you speak um, Spanish and the other? Quechua? Uh, Quechua? No, Quechua is a language I didn't learn. No, I think my grandma had a little, she grew up um, speaking some, but then as she grew up too, she lost a lot of it. So her parents and her, grandparents did. So would the Quechua language be more rural than yes. on the coast in the cities? Definitely. Mm -hmm. In a lot of the um, native communities, a lot of, um, a lot of those people speak Quechua. Now the population of Peru is about 34 million. A million people in Peru speak Quechua. So it's less than, or it's one, what, one fourth or so? Mm -hmm. And then can you talk about, we're sort of looking at these regions. Are they governed um, independently and there's a central government? How does that work? Yeah, so there is a central government, the president, but each region has a, an authority. So it'll be um, not a governor, more like a mayor. Mm -hmm. So each, there are 26 regions, each of them have their, um, their mayor but then it's a centralized government by the president. And are the offices of the centralized government in Lima then? Lima, mm-hmm, okay. yeah. Do you have any rough idea approximately how many uh, proven heritage people live in our valley now? No, I don't, sorry. <laughs> the question, how far is the Coca Coca Canyon from Arequipa. From Arequipa is actually fairly close. You can make um, the trip in three hours drive, drive three hour drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was there in 2017 with my family for the first time because all the, you know, a lot of um, the times growing up, we would spend our summer vacation in Arequipa, but it would be mostly like family family time, not a lot of trips here to the touristic attractions, like more like in my, sometimes in my grandma's farms and then sometimes in her house. So a lot of the time we didn't go to places like the Colca Canyon growing up. So I did go back in 2017, which was my last time visiting Arequipa, my grandma and my family there. Yeah. Any other, I th good, keep them coming. Well, I'm just wondering about your family, if there's anybody else in the US, any sisters, no. cousins? No, nobody else. That's why I actually go quite often to visit my family every couple of years or so, because everyone is back home um, in Arequipa and in Lima, because my dad, from my dad's side of the family, they're from Lima, from a small town in the south of Lima. Um, so yeah, everybody is, in Peru, I'm the only one here. It was a difficult decision when I decided to stay here and live here because, yeah, it's hard. <clears throat> it's hard not being with your family and especially, you know, just not expecting it or not planning to move somewhere and then telling your parents, I'm, I'm getting married, I'm staying. <laughs> uh, so that was a tough talk with them. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah, so I go often to visit them. And every opportunity that I go to Peru, I try to visit a new city that I haven't been to. Like a lot of those photos are from our travels. In 2010, and actually my husband and I, before we had our daughter, we moved to Peru for six months of the year because I had to finish one class for my bachelor's degree and we lived there for six months. And for my husband, it was a huge change because he, uh, he's from Arizona, he's from a small town, and he's used to this small town. And then Lima is a huge city. Think LA or New York and traffic and trains and cars and, sorry, not trains, um, but a lot of traffic and a lot of buses and just crime and so many things, but he made it. <laughs> he made it for six, six months of the year. I haven't had a lot of connection with Peruvians, but some, and it seems to me <clears throat> that they're very well educated. Would, how would you con contrast the Peruvian education with here in the US, if you can? I think it's a little hard because since I did all of my studies in Peru, I don't have a really good sense of the education here in like a university level. What I can tell from um, my experience with my daughter, who now has finished elementary school, and what I hear from maybe other states and um, friends in different parts of the states is that the education here in Blaine County is amazing. And like I always talk about Alturas Elementary because it's where my daughter is, but um, it's amazing because they have a dual immersion program where they're teaching the kids in English <coughs> and in Spanish. And in the beginning, I, th I thought um, at that time we lived in Ketchum. She had been in the preschool in Ketchum. Mm -hmm. And we were leaning towards um, Hemingway School. But then I was like, she's not really going to learn Spanish because she was like, well, she's little, you're a kid, and your friends, and you know, everything in your life is in English. Why would she want to learn another language when she is five years old, right? So that's one of the amazing things about uh, the program here at yes. Alturas Elementary. Um, a lot of the universities in Peru are very uh, well known internationally. Um, I th feel like it is, um, it's a good level of education, but um, some of the private schools may have a little more um, of, of a better reputation, per se, which not a lot of people have access to. Mm -hmm. I studied in a public university. It's called university, um, San Marcos National University, and it's the oldest university in South America. Mm -hmm. And I think like it was great. It, was, it had a high level of education. But um, so yeah, in, in, in the sense of higher education after elementary, I, I think from what I've heard, not from experience, I think it's, it's good here in the States too. It's expensive though. <laughs> yes. How about um, people in rural areas in Peru? Um, some people have come from there and also they are very, adept at learning uh -huh. and um, in one generation send three of their sons off to, you know, get PhDs and so forth. So it just seems to me <coughs> that it's easy for them to learn or maybe it's because of the uh, being a, a um, coming to another country that they're really I think have it, uh, a lot of ability to, mm -hmm. to I think, get where they want to go. Yeah, I think the drive may come also from, from that. If you want to come to another country and you want to be successful, you want to you know, have a certain level of education and be able to thrive in a country that is not yours and maybe even try harder because you are in a, in a different place and you want to be able to rise to the challenge. And I think, I don't know for everyone, but the, um, 
you know, the way your parents raise you. Like my mom would always be like, you have to have an education, right? You have to have, you have to finish high school, then you have to do your university. You have to, like, you can have a boyfriend after you finish university. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, so I think um, from my personal experience, a lot of it comes from the parents too. You know, they teach you that it's important, and that's what I'm teaching my daughter. And she's very proud. Like last night, she was just showing us her grades, and she's she's always very proud and so like happy to show us her grades because she like she wants to show that she did great work. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people have that too in them. So maybe we'll take one more question and then turn the lights up and let you show some of the yeah. um, cultural items that you've brought. Just a quick question. There's, and I know you, you don't live now in Peru, but there's a history of all the presidential turnover. And for the first time, Peru now has a woman president. Mm -hmm. How is she being accepted? And is there a feeling that maybe that she's going to be able to help and have more stability mm -hmm. than what has happened of late? Yeah, so I keep somewhat um, tales of what's happening. Unfortunately, in the last few years, 10 years or so, the presidents have not been good. There is always some sort of corruption going on or something. And the last president was impeached, and the vice president, which is a woman, unfortunately had no support from the population. There was no support at all, which on one hand is sad, right? Because it's a woman and in a world where women are more needed in uh, charges, you know, like being a president or vice president. Um, she, yeah, she had no support at all from the population. So they, the people wanted uh, new elections to elect someone they wanted to be president. So unfortunately, yeah, no support. I don't know the details of it, why. It may have to be related um, to the president that was impeached because she was on the same party, on the same political party. So unfortunately, not, not good. And elections are coming up in Peru in April. This April is spring 2024. So hopefully it will go in a better direction because the political environment was really bad in the last few months. There were a lot of riots, a lot of um, protests, and a lot just going on throughout the country. Thank you, Jessica. If everybody will give me just a sec, I'll turn the lights on, and you can talk about your uh, interesting yeah. objects up there. Thank you, Kristen. So yeah, if you want to come over and see some of the items. Um, these are very popular in Peru. They're called retablos, and they're like... Oh, the camera. Yeah, so these are like um, from indigenous uh, people created, and it's like the... Um, um, what do you call it? The nativity. the nativity, yes, but in a... Yeah, in a sort of um, indigenous style. And these are just ceramics that I brought from Peru and textiles. These patterns are very um, colorful and somewhat similar in some countries in South America. But um, these are very, um, just very representative of the colors and uh, patterns of the Andes in Peru. And these are some of the um, Uros, um, boats that they use in the floating isla, islands uh, from the reeds made of Totora. So I brought this from that trip we made. Um, you said the floating island. The island isn't really floating. Is it? They just re it is moving it is. around? Well, it's, it's, it's not moving, but it's floating somehow. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And then this here, like these uh, seeds are very uh, uh, popular in Peru, they're supposed to give you good luck. And then just some other um, clothing items that are brought. But yeah, some of these are, are not. oh, this one is a cool one. You fill it up in the bottom, 
you put the water here and then you just pour like that. So very. Wait, wait, let's, wait, let's see how that works. Yeah, I'll give you my water. <laughs> And it doesn't drip. I'll pour. Yeah. Let's see. Magic. <gasps> what? And then so you can. Like, oh and then my, you can pour it. Oh. That is very cool. Yeah. I like that. Magic. <laughs> Yeah, and these are the alfajores, so please help yourself. So you have to try one. Yeah. So is there a difference between the star and the circle? Yes. <laughs> are they different, though? No, it's the same. I just had two different cookie cutters, and I was like, oh. Yeah. Mm. Make sure. Mm. Thank you. How do you do that? That's magic. <laughs> Wool. wool. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, and this one I brought from Cusco. Oh. Mm -hmm. And this one from Arequipa. They're similar, but this is a little more um, fine wool compared to this one. Um, this one is from Arequipa, and that one is from Cusco. Yes. We should have another cookie. Yes. <laughs> Help yourself. Well, while everybody dives into their second cookie, I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, thank Jessica. Thank you. Um, for sharing about Arequipa and Peru. This was really a wonderful presentation. So um, good night, everybody.